Okay. <clears throat> I'll admit, uh, throwing myself on the mercy of the court, I did not get a ch uh, to grade your um, uh, exam two yet, which is, I guarantee you, uh, as, as much as it's um, irritating you, it's probably irritating me even more because now I have another exam and another class on top of it that I have to start grading. So, so yeah, it, it just didn't happen. Uh, sick toddler this weekend. You know how it goes. Um, or you will. Okay, so, um, you know, usually, I guess around right now, I'd ask, uh, uh, you know, how's the class going so far? But actually, if you look at the topics we have left, we don't have that much left. Um, we're in lecture 30, and there's only 41 lectures in the semester, and we're canceling this day. So there's actually not a lot left. Um, today is going to be our last sort of centroids-focused lecture where we're taking a, a little bit of a detour and talking about moments of inertia. And then the next four lectures uh, I'm planning to have devoted to structural analysis. We're going to do two lectures on trusses, two lectures on shear and moment diagrams. And assuming those go well, um, what we'll do is we'll have um, uh, an introductory lecture uh, for our final topic uh, on friction the, the um, Friday before the week before Thanksgiving break. The week before Thanksgiving break, we'll have our exam review Monday. We'll have the exam Wednesday, uh, Wednesday uh, and we'll cancel class on Friday. What I'm going to do during dead week so that you are aware, um, that Monday when we come back, we're going to finish friction. Friction is not going to take very long. It's going to take one, maybe two lectures. Wednesday, what we're going to do on Wednesday is we're going to have, well, the Wednesday of dead week, is we're going to have a course re uh, review, the whole course, because the final is comprehensive. And so Wednesday is going to be devoted solely to just recapping everything that we've been doing for the past, you know, uh, uh, 13, 14 weeks. And then Friday of dead week is our Q&A session for the final. So because there's more stuff, I figure we'll have one day devoted to just recapping what we've been doing, and uh, the final is or the, the Q&A session on Friday. I'll tell you, because uh, I know you're probably thinking about exam three, the last thing you're thinking about is the final, but um, I don't think that the final, I know it sounds, you know, you hear the word comprehensive and you go, hoo, hoo. Uh, I don't think it's uh, that bad. I think each of the exams that we have, the one through three, are a little bit more into the details, whereas the final is a little bit more big picture, so I don't think you're going to find it to be terribly challenging. I've had students tell me that they thought the easiest exam was the final, so you know, uh, so, so take that for what it's worth. The final is Friday, the final is late, Yeah, which means I have that weekend to grade them all. <laughs> I drew the short straw on that one, yeah. I, I drew the last time slot. So for us as faculty, the grades are due. It's either Monday at noon or Tuesday at noon, so I, I have to get them graded, you know. So um, one of the things I will give you after exam three, I have a spreadsheet that, that I call the at-home game. And what you can do is you can plug in your grades and you can figure out, okay, if I want to make an A in the class, I need to get this grade on the final. Or if I want to get a B in the class, I need to make, get this grade on the final. A buddy of mine in grad school called that playing the at-home game. So um, I'll post that on Teams near the, uh, near the end. So any questions? Yes? Um, there's only one. It's the friction homework. Um, and dependent upon how this goes, because I don't want to rush structural analysis, I might prepare that assignment before Thanksgiving break and accept it like dead week. So, but only one. And it's going to be pretty short. It's not going to be long. So, because I, I don't want to overload you with work during you know during dead week, because I know you're trying to finish stuff up and and um, uh, get ready for the final. Kinda, yeah. I mean, we're gonna have, we're gonna finish the friction lecture. We're gonna finish, or the topic of friction. We're gonna do a course review and then do the Q and A session for the final. So that's gonna be dead weight. So sound good? <clears throat> All right. I'm gonna need your help today on on uh, computation. We're gonna do a lot of them. So uh, make sure you have your calculators out. Uh, I think this is a good one to be interactive anyway. So I kind of purposefully left my notebook uh, at, at the office, which I don't know. We'll see how that goes. Um, okay. So if you recall, last time I discussed uh, the, the mathematics of the integration that we've been doing so far. So for example, if I, if I sum up 
the little rectangles, the little rec uh, DA rectangles along a given region, I get the area. And if I sum up x times those rectangles, I get the first moment of area. And then x squared times those rectangles, I get the second moment of area. So um, we have a name for that, uh, that, se uh, that second moment of area. We call it the area moment of inertia. Now we do flip the, su uh, the subscripts a little bit. So the integral of x squared dA is referred to as iy because how far away you are from the y-axis, like if here's the here's the y-axis, here's the x-axis, how far you are from the uh, y-axis is x. So that's why they're flipped. Um, but moments of inertia have a very, very profound impact on structural response. Um, they are essentially the measure uh, uh, by which you determine how stiff an element again is against flexure. And just about any system you're going to build I don't care if you're civil, mechanical, biomedical, doesn't, doesn't matter. Just about any system that you're going to build is going to have something in it that's being bent. And so understanding the flexural strength or stiffness of an element is usually directly proportional to its moment of inertia. Now, um, I want to show you something. You don't need to like follow all the super hyper detailed math here, but um, uh, if you recall, you know, we're basically integrating this you know, y squared dA um, one of the things that matters is where you're defining your coordinate system, at least from a theoretical perspective. So if I have some arbitrary shape, uh, it's not just what is the moment of inertia, but what is the moment of inertia with respect to what coordinate system. We have to make sure that we're uh, uh, speaking in an apples-to-apples -apples, uh, fashion. And so um, one of the most common, uh, I would say the most common location about which to define the moment of inertia is to define the coordinate system uh, with respect to the centroid of the shape in question. Uh, all of the, the theory that we use with flexure and column buckling, all that stuff, that you name it, that we'll be talking about next semester in Engineering 216, Mechanics of Deformable Bodies, all the moments of inertia that we discuss in there are discussing moments of inertia with respect to a centroid. So if, first off, if I want to do the math, let's just follow along what would happen here. So what am I doing? I'm taking these DA elements, right? These DA elements are this little rectangle, right? B wide, DY thick, right? And I'm integrating that, so I'm summing those from a region of negative H over 2 to H over 2. So if I have a rectangle that's B wide, H tall, go through and chug out all the integration, and you find that the moment of inertia with respect to the x-axis is BH cubed over 12. That is an incredibly, like, I would say familiar formula to most engineers, BH cubed over 12. It's something that most civil mechanical engineers and whatnot kind of have burned into the back of their memory by the time they graduate with the, an undergraduate degree, so you'll probably use that quite a bit. We'll use that today. Um, <coughs> what we have here uh, is akin to a centroid reference. We have a moment of inertia reference. Now, first off, this list isn't complete. I believe it's figure 912 in your textbook that has all of the moments of inertia for various simple shapes, but you got to be real careful about using this aid. For example, if you look here at this uh, rectangular uh, region here, you see, and I know it's a little blurry here, but you see two sets of moments of inertia. And you got like an IX, an IY, and an IX, and an IY, and they're, and they're different. And you're like, why are there two different ones? The difference is the coordinate system. One of the moments of inertia are, are uh, expressed with respect to this coordinate system here, with the origin sort of defined at this lower left corner. And the other is with respect to the centroid of the shape in question. Same thing, for example, with this triangle. There's a moment of inertia with respect to the x-axis and a moment of inertia with respect to the centroidal x-axis. Okay? So um, more often than not, uh, we typically define our moments of inertia or the ones that we're going to be utilizing are with respect to the shape's centroids. Okay? So you need to make sure that you're, you're careful in, in which value that you use. So we're going to be using the ones with respect to the centroidal axis. So, for example, in this rectangular uh, 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 diagram, there's the x and y axis, and then there's the x prime and y prime axis, which go through the centroids. So that's going to be the one that we utilize. Now, the way that we compute the uh, centroid of a composite shape, like this is how we, or, sorry, not the centroid, the moment of inertia. We can compute the moment of inertia of a rectangle with just, you know, this, uh, 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 you know, look it up. But if we wanted to compute the moment of inertia of like this right here, 
The way that we would do that is through the use of what's called the parallel axis theorem. The, the way that the parallel axis theorem operates is it says, okay, if I know how to compute the moment of inertia of some you know, arbitrary shape about some arbitrary axis, what if I want to compute the moment of inertia about a new axis? So for instance, I have the moment of inertia about the x-axis. What about a new x-axis at some distance away from, uh, uh, from the y-axis? So if this is the integral of y squared dA, the idea is let's expand this to say, well, it's not y squared, it's y plus some increment squared, okay? I take this, I foil it out. So remember, you know, front times front, outside times outside, inside times inside, you, you know the drill. And I've got this, and then what I do is I say, okay, let's take this and split it up into, into some separate integrals. So I've got this term right here, which is the original moment of inertia, this term right here, which is dy squared times this, which is the area, and then this. Well, this is uh, a bunch of junk multiplied by the integral of y dA. Well, if I define my coordinate system at the centroid, the way that I determine the centroid is I take this integral and I divide it by this integral. But if I define the origin at the centroid, then this integral is going to go to zero. So we cancel all this out, and we end up left with this. This formula right here, or more specifically this formula, where all I'm doing is I'm taking this term i plus ad squared and summing it for all of the shapes in a given region is what's called the parallel axis theorem. Basically, this is the algorithm that we are going to use to compute the moment of inertia of a more complex shape. Okay? So we take the centroidal moment of inertia of each individual shape and add to that ad squared. A being the area of the, uh, the individual shape, and D being this term here. Okay? And D is the distance from the centroid of the individual shape to the centroid of the whole thing. And I know it seems complicated, but as you start going through the process, you're going to find this is actually very algorithmic, very plug and chug, uh, and it, it's, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. Once you get the process down pat, you'll find this is actually pretty rote and pretty mechanical. Um, I think the easiest way to explain the process is to do an example, okay? So we're going to compute the moment of inertia of this shape right here with respect to the centroidal uh, uh, x-axis. So in other words, we're only looking at the moment of inertia this way. So if the best way you could, here's the best way of thinking about it. Imagine, uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Mastrangelo that let me uh, borrow his ruler that one day. So imagine this is the cross-section of the ruler that's coming out of the screen, and I'm bending it this way. This number will tell us how stiff this element is against bending that way. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just dive right in, and let's see what we get. Now, what I have here on this, uh, this notebook here, let me close this. What I have here is I have the, the shape in question, and then I copy and pasted these centroid references here from the book, and they're a little bit bigger, so they're a little bit easier to read, so we won't have to squint and, and whatnot. But again, this is figure 912 out of your textbook. Again, you can probably just Google uh, moment of inertia reference, and you'll find all this data here. There's nothing really specifically all that um, uh, special about it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this up into a series of simple shapes very akin to what we've been doing for, uh, for centroids, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it up into four shapes. This, this, so we have a semicircle, a rectangle, a triangle, and then this circular hole here, okay? Um, all of my uh, uh, distances, because the first thing we're going to have to do is compute the centroid, all of my distances have to be referenced from a common reference axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reference all of my distances from this horizontal axis right here. So this is going to be my datum that I reference all my distances from. If you remember when we computed the location of centroids, we had to have a coordinate system about which that we could you know, reference everything. So we're just going to say everything's referenced from the bottom. Now what I'll do is I'll number these, I'll, and, and what I'm going to do is number them, I guess, from, I guess, increasing levels of complexity. So we'll say this is shape one, we'll call the triangle shape two, call that, uh, let's call the semicircle shape four, and let's call the whole shape three. Okay, so far so good? 
Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to number each of these shapes one at a time, and let's see what we can come up with. Now, let's take the rectangle. Uh, it is 10 inches wide. How tall is it? In fact, maybe, maybe a better way of asking that is, what is going on with this dimension right here? This dimension wasn't directly given, but we can uh, infer this. Anybody know what this dimension is? No? Yeah, I know why you said six, but it's not six. Eight. It's eight because this semicircular region here has a radius of four. So if this is a radius of four, it has a diameter of eight. D does that make sense? I know why you said three because I, I know when, even when I first saw it, I was like, it, yeah, it's six. Yeah, but that hole is not directly centered. So maybe what we ought to do is indicate that this is five. Everybody with me so far? Okay, let's start off with shape one. So, let me take this and make it maybe a little bit bigger. And so, like I said, I put a little centroid reference here so we'd have something to go off of. So, shape one is the rectangle. Okay, so we're going to need some data for this rectangle that we, um, that we populate our table with. The first thing that we're going to need to do is sort of think about this like an augmented centroid problem. So what I mean by that is we're going to need uh, the area and we're going to need the y distance, how far away the centroid is from the datum. So we'll call this A1, we'll call this Y1. Um, so let me ask you this, what's the area of that rectangle? Yeah, 10 times 8, it's 80. So we'll just put 80. Now what about Y1? How far is it from the datum to the centroid of that rectangle? Four inches. There we go. Now, what is now new is this term IX. And we'll call it um, IX, and I'm going to call it C1, okay? And the reason I'm calling it C1 is because it's the moment of inertia with respect to the x-axis, because that's what we're trying to find here in this problem, of shape one with respect to its centroid. Okay. Now I propose that that is b h cubed over 12. Okay. Now the order matters. Okay. When it's set, when it's talking about b, b is the dimension along this axis. Okay. H is the dimension along this axis. See, look what happens when we're trying to determine. I y, okay? See how it's it's flipped. It's not b h cubed. It's b cubed h. Make sure that you're very consistent on what dimension you're referring to, okay? So this is 10 inches, 8 inches cubed over 12, okay? What is that? So that's 10 times 8 times 8 times 8 over 12. 426.67. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, the units for this are inches to the fourth. Okay. And I know that might seem like a weird property, like what, what's going on with inches to the fourth. Just think of it as an area, and it's multiplied by, like, by a moment arm, but then multiplied by a moment arm again. Sort of like you know, there's velocity, meters per second, and then there's meters per second per second, you know. So it's not like you're squaring time, but, you know, it's just a, uh, that's, you know, it's just a rate of change again. So, okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Now let's do the triangle. Here, I'll drag this down here. Let's do the triangle. So here's the triangle. To make this a little bit bigger. Fortunately, the triangle is a little easy. First off, here's the triangle. Now, before I start plugging a bunch of values into these equations, what are B and H for our triangle in question? They're both eight inches. So I'm going to write that down. I'm going to say that B equals H equals eight inches so that I have that so I don't have to keep scrolling up. Now, 
Let me ask you a question. Which one of these two formulas am I going to use? Am I going to use BH cubed over 12 or BH cubed over 36? What, and why? Like which one and why? This one is with respect to the x-axis, and this one is respect, with respect to x prime, or this axis. What do you think? We're using centroidal moments of inertia here. Which is the centroidal axis, X or X prime? X prime. So that's the one that we're going to use. Okay. So like before, we need the area, the Y, but we're also going to need IXC2. And IXC2 is going to be BH cubed over 36. Okay. But before we get there, let's take it one step at a time. What's the area of this triangle? How, how do we compute the area of this triangle? B is 8 and H is 8. 32. 32, because it's B times H over 2, right? Oh, hold on. And Y2, how do we compute Y2? Well, that's the distance from the bottom to the centroid, okay? I'll scroll up a little bit so you can kind of see what I'm doing here. Okay, here's the datum, right? So here's the datum, there's the triangle. So from the datum to the centroid, which is about maybe like right there, H over three, does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? So this is H over three, eight inches over three, which is Something like what, 2.67? Does everybody see what I'm doing here? I want to make sure that you understand the process. What I'm doing is I'm computing the area of each shape, okay? I'm computing the y distance, how far it is from the datum, right? From the datum to the centroid of that shape. And now I'm computing this new term, the moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia is with respect to the centroid, okay? Everybody good? Now, if you're okay with that, let's go ahead and make sure that we're paying attention. What is the y distance for shape 3 going to be? No, not, for shape, not for the semicircle, for the hole. How far is it from the datum to the center of the hole? 5. How far is it from the datum to the center of the semicircle? 4. Does that make sense? So Y3 is going to be 5 inches, Y4 is going to be 4 inches. Okay, is everybody okay with that? All right, now, for, uh, let's look at shape 3. Shape 3 is this circle, okay? So, okay, shape 3. Shape 3 is a circular hole. And so R is one and a half inches, right? Because it was a three inch diameter hole. So the radius is one and a half inches, okay? So the area is, hold on, let me get this cleaned up. The area is pi R squared, which is pi times 1.5 squared. And what's that to like two decimal places? What's that? 7.07. Do I have a second on that? All right, cool. All right, 7.07 .07 inches squared. We said that Y3 was 5 inches, and now IX from the centroid of shape 3. And because it's a circle, the moment of inertia about the X axis and the Y axis is the same. It doesn't matter. And if we look at our reference, the coordinate system is located at the centroid. So there's no IX and IX prime or IY and IY prime. There's just one formula. Circles are kind of easy. So it's 1 fourth pi R to the fourth. So 1 fourth, so pi R to the fourth over 4. And what do we get?
Okay. Say it again. 3.98. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, is there anybody here that thinks I forgot something? Negatives. Negatives. This is a whole, right? So, what does that mean? It means that, and I'll use a different color, it means that the moment of inertia and the area are negative. It does not mean that the Y is negative because it's still five inches up, right? That, that, that didn't change. What was the J thing over there? That's a great question. That's a great question. The question was, what's the J? Okay, so here's, here's what it is. Okay, so I'll put note. So IX is the integral of Y squared DA. And IY is the integral of x squared dA. J in this case is the integral of xy dA. Okay? It's, it's what's called a product of inertia. Okay? And this doesn't mean a lot right now, but this here's where it comes into play, especially with circular cross sections. One of the things that uh, we have to deal with in engineering 216 is not just bending, but torsion, taking an element and twisting it. Okay, And so if the moment of inertia, the I value, is a representation of an element's resistance to bending, J is a, is a measure of an element's resistance to torsion. Okay, One of the things that you'll notice is that there's a J value for the circle, but not for the triangle. Right? Okay, one of the things that we'll talk about in Engineering 216 is that if you're ever going to twist something, you want it to be circular. Okay, there are reasons for that. Circular cross sections do not warp. Circular cross sections are the most efficient in resisting torsion. Okay, so that's what J is. So that's a great question. So we won't need to use it in here, but that's what it is. Next semester we will. So that's a, that's a great question. Any other questions? This is good stuff. All right, the semicircle. All right, so the semicircle what was the radius of the semicircle? Four inches. So a four. A4 is pi r squared over 2, right? Half of the area of a circle. Pi times 8 inches squared over 2, which is, what is that, 16 over 2, 8 pi? What is that? Is that the three, four yeah. Oh, you're right. Whoops. Sorry. You're, you're exactly right. So yeah, 16, 8 pi, sorry. That's what I meant. What is that? Do I have a second on that? All right, go. All right, we already said that Y4 was 4 inches. And one of those things about serendipity, um, IXC to the 4, or IXC for shape number 4, we get the same centroidal value here, 1, 4, or 1, 8 pi r to the fourth. So pi times 4 inches to the fourth over 8 is what? I'm going to have a sip of my coffee. Anybody have an answer on this? 100.53. Do I have a second on that? All right. And this is inches to the fourth. Okay. So like I said, the, fir the first part of this problem is just the data collection. It's just the bookkeeping and the, um, the, the associated computations. Okay. Now, everybody with me so far? Does anybody need a sec to catch up? Okay. All right. What we're going to do from here is we're going to do some tabular calculations. Okay, this is going to have a lot of columns. It's going to have like seven columns. So if you want to do this sideways on your sheet of paper, that might be fine. 
but just know you're going to have like seven columns. Okay? So the shape column is going to go here, and we've got one, two, three, four shapes here, and we put the sums down here. Now, the first thing that we need to do, and the first half of this table is going to be real familiar, okay? The first half of this table is going to be the centroid. So help me out with the areas so I don't have to scroll up and down. What was the area of shape one? I think it was 80. This one was 32, wasn't it? Okay, shape three, I don't remember that one. And this one, maybe I can scroll up a little bit for shape four. 25.13. Is that fair? So can somebody add these up and tell me what we get? Say it again. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now the Y distances. Let's do the Y distances. So I can cheat. I know that this one is four. I think this one was five, if memory tells me correct. This one was four, and this one was 2.67. Did I get that right? Wow. I can't believe I remember that. Now what we're going to do is AY, right? Because we're computing a centroid right now, okay? There's going to be some more columns over here, don't you worry. This is, this is going to be the new stuff. But right now, it's just centroid, okay? So let's see. A times Y, that's 320. All right. Um, I might need some help on these. 88. 88 even? All right, this one's like 35.35? Yeah. Negative. And this is like what, 100.52? Yeah. Okay, so now sum this column up and tell me what you get. Which, by the way, any engineers think what would be a very valuable tool for this exercise? I'll okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, break out the slide rule. Come on now. All right, what, what we got for this sum? 476, Do I have a second on that? Okay, so would you agree then that therefore Y bar is the sum of AY over the sum of A, which is 470.61 cubic inches over 130.06 square inches? What is that? 3.62 inches. Do I have a second on that? Okay, so this is the this is this should be not new at all. This should be simple. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Okay. Now here comes the new stuff. Okay. The first thing I want to write are these. These IXCs that I computed, right? So my memory's gonna, gonna be a little fuzzy on this. So what, what did we get for shape one? It was like 426.67. Was it something like that? Is that right? All right, what did we get for shape two? All right, this shape was negative. What did we get there? And this one I can read is 100.53. All right. Did I get these written down correctly? Okay. All right. Now pay attention because this is important. Okay. Now, the theory that we're using is this formula right here, that the moment of inertia is the sum of I plus AD squared. 
This is the formula that we're using. That's, that's our method, okay? So look at this formula right here. What do we have? Do we have the little ICs? Yeah, they're right here. Do we have the areas? Yeah, we have them right here. Do we have D distances? No, we do not, okay? The Ds we do not have. So we have to compute those, but they are very easy, okay? The, if you remember from the slide, the, de the, the definition of D is the distance from the centroid of each individual shape to the centroid of the whole thing. We know the centroid of the whole thing from the datum is 3.62, and we know the distance to the centroid of each individual shape. The D distances are just Y minus Y bar. So for example, Y minus Y bar, 0 0.38. Do you see what I did? So what's 2.67 minus that? Negative 0 0.95. Do I have a second on that? What about uh, this one? This next one's what? 1.38? Am I doing that right? And this one's 0 0.38. Now let me ask you a question. Does it really matter what order I do the subtraction in? Why, why are you shaking your head no? Because I'm going to square it. It doesn't matter, right? So it doesn't matter what order that you do the, uh, the subtraction in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take IXC plus ADY squared. So maybe I should have put DY here. So I'm going to do that for each row. Each row, I'm going to take this plus that times that squared. So maybe I'll use some colors there. I'll take that plus that times that squared. Okay? So somebody help me out. For that first row, what are we going to get? 474.22. Do I have a second on that? Everybody get, did, did, did I get that right, or is there a second on that? Four thirty-eight point two two. Uh oh, we got some controversy here. And I've got more people shaking their head at that. That this is four thirty-eight point two two. I think we're gonna go with it. All right. What about this next row? That plus that times this squared. And again, the negative doesn't really matter because I'm gonna square it. One forty two point six six. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Line three. I'll show you a couple things before we close it out. I'll show you some Excel stuff and maybe some AutoCAD stuff. So what about for the second one? I plus A times D squared. This row should be negative. Everybody following along with what I'm doing? I'm taking this plus that times that squared. Second. All right. And the last row. So that plus that times that squared. See, what you're basically doing is you're adding up the moments of inertia, 
but you have to add them up by the values shifted so that they're all along the same axis. And that's what this AD squared uh, term is doing. 104.16, do I have a second? All right. All right, so sum that column up, what do you get? Say it again. Do I have a second on that? So therefore, what I would do is I would say the moment of inertia is about 668 inches to the fourth. That's the answer. Like I said, I got a few more things to show you before we before we close it. So, this is stuff that you'll you'll appreciate. Right. Does anybody have any questions on this? Okay, let me show you a couple of other things before we we close it out. So the first thing I want to do is you know uh, hopefully you recognize that like this is not a hard computation, but it does take a little bit of time. But fortunately, it's kind of rote. For some of the shapes in the manual, or so, sorry, uh, and maybe I should talk a little bit about the manual, but for some standard cross sections, the, um, the, the, the moments of inertia are really just tabulated values for you. I'm a civil engineer and I'm a bridge engineer and I can't help but teach you a little bit about bridges. If you go to the back of your textbook, you will find tables like this. These are properties for selected rolled steel sections. Um, and just so you are aware a little bit of the naming convention, so let's say, let's look at this shape, I don't know, right here. Oh, I colored over it. This shape right here, uh, it's kind of hard to read, but it, it shows up on the slide. This is a W14 by 38. Just so you are aware, the W sort of uh, refers to the type of section it is. So like we have W sections, we have channels, these are C shapes, we have standard shapes. The 14 is about how deep it is. Uh, and the 38 is about how heavy it is. So it's a W14 by 38 is about 14 inches deep and it weighs 38 pounds per foot. Before this section, we have the area, the moment of inertia, and so on and so forth, and there are pre-computed values for you. So for a lot of practical applications, a lot of this stuff is just uh, lookups for you. But just so you're aware of a couple of things, um, let me show you some Excel stuff for this example that we just did. And I'm going to load up AutoCAD because AutoCAD can take a little while to load. Um, so, for example, for the shape that we just did, come on, what did we have? We had the area times 8, right? Right? And so on and so forth. So one of the things that you can do is utilize Excel to do a lot of the math for you. Um, the big thing to keep in mind, and we're actually starting to run, on, run out of time, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll dispense with a lot of this. Maybe I'll do this one on Excel on a previous or on a separate recording. But you need to make sure that you're using your cell references appropriately, particularly when you're doing the, uh, the D distances. We're probably not going to have a lot of time to go through all of this. I'll do that on a on a little bit of a separate recording. But one thing we are going to have time to do, and I do want to show you this, is on AutoCAD. So let me just show you something here. So here's AutoCAD, and let's um, draw some random shape. Okay, so let's just do this, 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 this. Okay, so there's some random shape. What I'm going to do is I'm going to type out the word region. Okay, you'll notice that the way Autodesk products work is it automatically sort of populates with the command that uh, that you're that it's looking for. So we'll do region um, and see how like AutoCAD is sort of referencing that each of these are separate objects. Well, if I select them all and say enter. Now what it's done is now it's created as if, as if it's one single object. It's created one single loop. And then there's another command called mass prop. 
MASS properties like MASS prop, press enter, select the shape, press enter, and then you get this. Okay. So first off, it tells you the cross-sectional area of that shape, the perimeter, so on and so forth. If I press enter to continue, hold on, wait, let me go down here. Um, press enter to continue, what do I have? I have the location of the centroid, I have the moments of inertia, I have the product of inertia, that's that integral of y, x, y, dA. I have the radii of gyration. We have we don't we have talked about what the radii of gyration is. All the radii of gyration is is taking the moments of inertia, dividing it by the area, and then taking the square root. It basically just is a way of normalizing the moment of inertia so it comes out in inches. We aren't going to have to worry about that in here. But the idea is that it computes all of those sections for you. Now, one of the things that it does do is it computes the moment of inertia with respect to the global coordinate system. So it's telling you what the moment of inertia is with respect, hold on, let me hit escape of this, let me get this out of the way. It's telling you what the moment of inertia is with respect to this coordinate system right here. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna say, okay, this told me that the centroid of this shape, what did it say? It said the centroid of the shape was what? 21.0122 comma that. So I got a little trick up my sleeve. What we're gonna do is we're gonna enter a new command. We're gonna call UCS. UCS stands for User Coordinate System. What I'm going to do is specify the origin as that new point. And when I press Enter, let's see, hold on. Now the coordinate system is located at the centroid. So now if I do mass prop again, now I've got centroidal moments of inertia. So all I have to do is drag that up. Oh, come on. Drag that up to see this. So now these moments of inertia are with respect to the centroid. It's almost like I told you the solution or a way of checking your solution on the next homework assignment. You know what I mean? You could draw out the moment of, or the shape in AutoCAD and then do this. It's like I you know, recorded this and put this on YouTube so you can always refer to it uh, as a way of checking to see whether or not your uh, uh, computation is correct. It's also a way of just gut checking your calcs uh, for later. We'll stop for a sec, see if anybody has any questions. All right, what I've given you uh, for homework is a problem that only contains rectangles, so it should be a lot easier to do. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is make sure that you're consistent with your widths, right? Whenever it says BH cubed over 12, B is this dimension. H is this dimension, you know, if you're doing a, a moment of inertia with respect to a horizontal axis. B is horizontal, H is vertical. So make sure that you're consistent with that, okay? But I think you're going to find this homework pretty simple. That's all I got, everybody. I will see you all on Wednesday. We start structural analysis then.